Hello, this is Dave Gilbert, and welcome to the commentary track for the Blackwell Legacy. This is the voice you're going to be hearing babble at you throughout the course of the game. And if you ever get uh, tired of me talking, or if I'm talking too much, or you just get sick of the sound of my annoying voice, you can uh, just hit any key on the keyboard, and I will dutifully disappear and shut up. Uh, to start with, I guess I just want to thank you for purchasing the game. That's really cool of you. Uh, you're, you're keeping me in coffee and, and stuff while I, while I write these games. A um, bit of history, I guess. This game originally started as a freeware game way back when, uh, 2002, 2003. It was a game called Bestowers of Eternity, and it was quite a bit different. Um, it starred uh, Rose Angela Blackwell, and uh, it involved Joey to a, to a lesser extent. Um, and I never actually finished the game. It was never complete, but I released it anyway and slapped a really lame to be continued at the end and kind of ended on a really bad, nasty cliffhanger, which had everyone really, really annoyed at me. But people really seemed to like the game, and so earlier this year when I was thinking about making episodic games, I thought about Bestowers, and I thought it was well suited to an episodic format because you have two characters that you could you know, relate to, you could follow throughout a series, and there was a nice backstory that could be revealed over time, and since they were investigators, uh, each game could be another investigation. So I thought that worked out well. So that's a bit of history for you. That's how this game got started and conceived. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the game. Or rather, I hope you did enjoy the game, because I do recommend playing the game first, because I will be giving stuff away. So uh, if you want to avoid evil spoilers, and you haven't played the game, I suggest you turn this commentary off. Otherwise, click that New Game button, and we'll begin. Hi, this is Dave Gilbert. You have activated the five years later commentary track for Blackwell Legacy. It has been, obviously, five years since I released the game and since I've been upgrading and revamping the game uh, a little bit. I thought it would be a good opportunity to hop on the mic again and voice any additional thoughts uh, now that so much time has passed and other Blackwell games have been released uh, since I made this game. A um, little bit of warning, if you have the original commentary active, you're going to be hearing my voice a lot, <laughs> so just to warn you. Um, other than that, uh, I will be interrupting you as you play, so um, let's continue on. I made a very small change to this uh, opening scene. Originally, Rosa walked in from off screen. She walked in from the right, stopped where she is now, and then she delivered her lines and tossed the ashes off. Uh, and I decided to change that um, and have it start with her already standing there looking out. Uh, it's a very minor change, but it's effective because now, originally, it was Rosa walks in, delivers her lines, and it just seemed very quick. She didn't take a moment to reflect. She just sort of walked in and did it. And this way, uh, who knows how long she's been standing there looking out over the water. Uh, so it, it kind of make, gives it a little bit of a more softer edge. She's a little bit more reflective, and uh, you sort of start and media res you don't know why she's there uh so it's just a very very tiny change and i've spent you know all this time talking about it but i think it was an effective one matt gardner playing the doorman here is a guy uh, from arizona this amazing cartoonist uh he does a lot of these flash cartoons on newgrounds you should check him out his username there is wogoat w-o-g-o-a-t and uh, he does these fantastically hysterical X-Men parodies. So if you're into X-Men, you should, you should check that out. Uh, he does the voices for his own cartoons mostly. So uh, I knew he had good equipment. I know he could, uh, he could do voice acting. So um, when he offered to do a voice, I said, hey, yeah, sure. Come on, check it out. Uh, he also did most of the sketches for the close-up photographs in this game. Um, yeah, so that's Matt. As I was upgrading this game, there was a, a real strong instinct uh, and temptation to play George Lucas and change everything. Uh, and I resisted that. Uh, but this first puzzle and section is, is would have been at the top of the list. Uh, I was worried that when I started this commentary, a lot of it would be me just going, what was I thinking and apologizing a lot. And, and this is one of them. This was not the best way to kick off a series with this very arbitrary, very gamey puzzle. And at the time, my way of thinking was, well, Rose is this very, she's this very socially recalcitrant person, and this is kind of a way of forcing her out into the world, which, yeah, as a character study, it works, but as a game, it's a very annoying puzzle. And it's, it's the, the first thing you do in the game, you're told no. And one thing I've learned about, about game design and making games is that you want the first couple of actions to feel rewarding. 
and, and to feel, you want to feel good about the stuff you do. And here, there's just brick walls thrown at you no matter what you do, like within the first two seconds of playing. And that was bound to frustrate people. And I would have designed this completely differently if I could start over. Um, but I didn't change it, uh, A, because I, I don't think – I think that would have been ridiculous to completely change everything. Um, so I kept it as it was, and uh, I'll apologize in this commentary. The map screen was hard to design because three of the locations were fairly close to each other, and one of the locations was, was far away. So it was hard to really come up with a good um, design for it. Originally, I just had this – stupid little menu um, just for the beta testing stage. And then finally, E.L. Jammer, a uh, graphic artist who came on board originally to do um, photographs. Uh, I'll talk about that later. But um, he uh, offered to do extra stuff. And I, one of the first things I asked him to do, I said, hey, could you come up with a, a map screen? I'm totally stumped. And he came up with this design and uh, these big icons that represent um, different areas, the locations you go to. And it, it works really well because um, the icons are big enough that the fact that um, some of them, one of the locations is farther away uh, than the others, it didn't really matter so much. So um, I, I can't quite explain how it worked, but it, it does work, and uh, I think it works well. This is a real place. Washington Square is a real park. And this dog park does exist, and it's usually a lot busier than it is uh, than you see now. There are usually lots of little dogs running around, and I have lots of fond memories of this place. There was a a dog, uh, my friend's dog, that I was looking after a few years ago, and I brought the dog to this dog park, and it was heck of a lot of fun just uh, watching the dogs just run around. And I made the mistake of bringing a breakfast sandwich with me one morning, and I, I was very popular with the dogs that day. Each Blackwell game has uh, an area that is um, based in a real place, and this is obviously Washington Square Park, and this is the dog run in Washington Square Park. And it's funny how most of the locations that are based on real places, and I took care to like get photograph references for the artists, they have all changed since their debut in in their game this area of washington square park is completely different now the entrance is on the street side of the park uh this area is all fenced off they renovated the park um last year and it's uh for the most part it looks the same but the dog run is completely different so you can no longer go to the park and and see this image which is a shame but you can play blackwell and virtually walk through washington square of years past there is a slight selfish aspect to writing a game or a story or a film that takes place um, in a real-world location, especially when it's your hometown or your home city. And that is you get to include locations that you really love. And this place, Washington Square Park, man, uh, it's just – I love this place. It's right by NYU. You get all the all the all the kids there. You get all the um, kids, meaning college kids. Uh, you get all the political rallies, the musicians, just all sorts of life just flows through this place, and it's just a great place to go and hang out. You know, sometimes I, when things get busy or hectic, I would sit down on a bench. I'd look at this exact view that you're looking at now, just munch on a sandwich, drink a cup of coffee or something, and just watch the world spin by. Um, this is my home right here, and I'm very happy that uh, Chris Fimo managed to get it right. Um, I really wanted to stress the fact that I wanted this to be accurate. That arch in the background, that fountain, they're so iconic uh, to Washington Square Park and New York in general. So uh, I'm, I'm glad I got to include this, uh, this location. This, again, is one of those moments I, I wish I thought a little bit more carefully about when I made the game five years ago. As a character study, I think it works really well. Um, but a lot of people hated this moment, and I can't blame them. Uh, here, Rose is trying to speak to Nishanti, but she's too shy to interrupt her in front of all of these people. And that's a very Rosa thing to do. It's totally understandable. But as a, as a gamer, as a player, wanting to do something and being told no, uh, being told not by the environment, being told no not by other characters or by the environment or even by the game, but by the character that you're playing. Your avatar is saying, no, you can, no, I can't do this. I'm not going to do it. And it just creates this immediate disconnect between the player and the character that um, I think was a very bad thing. Uh, if I was redoing this now, I'd have come up with something different. It worked as a character study, um, and a lot of people liked that for what it was. But I think as a game device, as, a, as an actual game, I did think it failed. Um, and so... But, uh, 
again, I was new. <laughs> this is uh, my first attempt at a commercial game, so hopefully I could be forgiven. So I want to give some advice to any of you budding adventure game designers out there who might conceive of using a dog and a dog leash um, in their game. I want you to heed my warning because uh, and, and benefit from the uh, value of my experience because I want to tell you firsthand this dog leash nearly killed me. And when I say it nearly killed me, I mean it nearly killed me. Because, holy crap, this dog leash would not do what it was supposed to do. Um, it's, a, it's a line that was drawn um, kind of on the fly using the engine um, from one point to another point. And I had to um, kind of use encoding to tell the dog leash where to go. And holy crap, was this, was this annoying. Either the dog leash would spontaneously uh, disappear for a second or two, or it would draw itself um, above the dog's head, or it would be absolutely perfect, and then the dog would turn, and the dog leash would be in a totally different location. Uh, getting Once I got that right, getting the dog leash to work perfectly while the dog walked around that friggin' lamppost, um, that proved to be an incredibly daunting task. I mean, this dog leash... I, I hate this dog leash. I, I hate it so much. I want to take this dog leash, rip it up, set it on fire, take the ashes, put them in the dumpster, and then set fire to the dumpster, and then take those ashes and then step on them. Ugh, I hate you, dog leash. God damn it, I hate you. Wow, um, th that felt really good. Um, yeah, so uh, dog leash, very hard. Oh, for heaven's sake. Don't worry, Moti, I'm coming. If you listened to the original commentary, you would have heard me rant about that dog leash and how hard it was to code. Uh, it plagues me even now, five years later, when I was upgrading this code, all of the um, commands that I used to create the dog leash five years ago uh, are no longer used in the current version of the Adventure Game Studio engine. So all of that hard work that I did five years ago, all that ranting that you heard me do in the previous commentary, that was all for nothing because uh, I had to redo it all again. Uh, so I had to figure out new commands, a whole new way of doing things because all those commands, those original commands no longer work. So yeah, no more dog leashes. I mentioned earlier how Chris Fimo came on board kind of towards the end. And Tom Scary had started to draw this picture, and I kind of implied that Chris, you know, start with that and just finish it. But um, I gave him the reference picture, and then he said, "Could I just, you know, could I just do it my way? Could I just do what I want?" And I said, "Yeah, sure." Uh, I misunderstood. I thought he meant, you know, could he do the picture his own way? You know, kind of using you know, the picture as a reference. He didn't realize that it was a real location. He thought I just showed him that picture just to show kind of what I had in mind he didn't realize it was a real place. So when he ended up drawing the picture, thank God it was just an outline, he had a bridge in the background, he had, you know, a river, he had this, you know, it was just totally wrong. And I took one look at it and it was just so detailed and so wonderful and I just said, oh God, look, I'm sorry, this is, this is great, but uh, it's wrong, I'm sorry. And um, I, I told him it was a real place, and he didn't realize it was a real place, and it was this horrible misunderstanding, but he was a good sport about it. Thank God he just did an outline and didn't actually do the whole, the whole picture, because you see how, how beautiful this picture is, and it would have been a real shame if he had to uh, do all that work for nothing. Ruth Weber, uh, the lady who is doing the voice of Nishanti here, you might recognize her from the Shiva, my previous game. She also played an Indian woman named Rajshri, and Ruth is not an Indian woman, in case you were wondering. It's just a, a coincidence. But in the Shiva, I had her do an accent. I had her do the Indian accent. And I learned my lesson. Not that Ruth was bad, far from it. It's just uh, I felt that when I tell actors to do accents, they tend to focus a lot of their energy onto making sure the accent is right than into actually acting. And I decided here that Nishanti would not have an Indian accent. And I kind of... Um, wrote the character as someone who was very Americanized all of her life and then later when she got to be older decided to reconnect with her Indian roots. Uh, so if she didn't have the accent, it was fine. And if there were some Indian culture things that I got wrong, it was okay because Nishanti isn't an expert on Indian culture. She's just kind of reconnecting with it 
uh, later in life. So she wears the sari, she plays the instrument, she's got some Indian decorations, but if it's not totally accurate, it's okay. So that was kind of an easy out, easy back door for myself. With this game, there was one thing I really wanted to get right above all things. Uh, it was to get the New York lifestyle, the New York attitude, the New York uh, scene um, across well to you guys. Um, I really wanted to show off the city, uh, not just the architecture, it's beautiful, parts of it are beautiful, but also just the attitude. Um, Rosa is a very New York-ish character, and what Nashanti says here is very, very true. Generally, we don't talk to our neighbors. I guess you can analyze it in, in many different ways, but um, if if you know if if you're out there on the other side of the world, you know from if you're uh, Europe, Asia, you know um, India, you know Africa, wherever you might be playing this game, if if you got a little taste of what New York was like through this game, then um, I was successful. I did what I really wanted to do. That little cheesy grin is perfect, perfect. I I got that from Ian one day, and I just started placing it everywhere I could. Because uh, it captures this perfect combination of like awkwardness and confusion and like trying to uh, I you can't quite explain it. It's this like I don't know how to react, so I'm just gonna smile awkwardly at you, and I, I just I like it. It really works out. Joey has something very similar. This really charming cheesy grin that I just kind of snuck in wherever wherever I could. So uh, and the beta testers actually. Um, before uh, I implemented Rose's smile, they would always remark how Rose seemed very cold and very harsh. Then I would stick that little smile in there, and suddenly they, they changed their minds. So uh, it's the magic of smiling, people. It's a, it's a lesson we all should adhere to. All right, Rosa. This wasn't my intention when I originally wrote this line five years ago, but it sort of started a, a character trait or a character trend, is that when she, uh, whenever she meets someone, it's always, Hi, I'm Rosangela. If she likes you, she'll say, call me Rosa. And that is the case with all the future Blackwell games. With um, Claude, she felt comfortable with Claude, so she said, call me Rosa. Um, she said, call me Rosa to Jeremy in Blackwell Deception. Uh, so that has become a, a very Rosa thing to do. Uh, when she likes you or she's comfortable with you, she'll say, call me Rosa. Otherwise, it's Rosangela all the way. One of the original background artists for this game, uh, this is like full disclosure now, it's five years later, statute of limitations, whatever, um, he kind of disappeared like three quarters of the way through the production process, <laughs> and it kind of left me high and dry, and at the time, I, I was determined to get this done. I was so determined. I had gambled everything, all my savings. I was like not sleeping half the time. I was pretty insane. I'll talk more about that later, but I was pretty insane. Like I was come hell or high water. I was going to be damned if I was not going to get this game out on the day that I said I was going to get it out. And um, this background artist who left, I think, almost all of the backgrounds in various stages of completion. So nothing was actually finished. And with like a month and a half to go, disappeared, gone, uh, left no address. Uh, or anything, and I had to really scramble. I burned through about like four or five other artists uh, to to finish this, and um, it, that's the main reason why in the original version of this game they are not that many hotspot descriptions. I talked about that before, how I decided to go back and add more of them, and I was able to do that by bringing Rebecca in to re-record uh, the lines. So uh, it's just interesting now how I always had to scrabble for artists back then, and I don't really have to do that anymore. So it's interesting to see how that's changed over time. Home. Thank God. I've never been so happy to see a 500 square foot room in my life. This room, strangely enough, uh, is one of the most frequently seen rooms in the game, but it was the last one drawn. And um, when Tom Scary, the background artist, he sent this to me, I'm just like, it's pink. And I have to admit, I never really thought much about uh, what Rose's apartment should look like. I always kind of imagined it as being very, just very bare with lots of books and not a lot of personality. And the fact that he made the walls so colorful, he made it a lot more colorful than I kind of imagined that they should be. But I look at it now and I kind of like it. Because I, I think that it was, it's very important to establish Rose's home as like her sanctuary, and it has to be comfortable. It has to be a place that you'd want to return to. Otherwise, you know, she wouldn't want to be there all the time, and that kind of makes sense. And the fact that it's pink is kind of nice because it, it gives Rosa a, a little bit more of a feminine quality, which she didn't really 
have before um, because she's so standoffish that you don't really get a sense of her personality most of the time. So it's nice that she has, you know, this this colorful apartment that kind of shows a little bit more of her. And I thought that was very effective. So nice, uh, nice call, Tom Scary. Way back when I uh, completed the freeware version of Shiva in June, uh, end of June 2006, it wasn't long before I got an email from a guy named E.L. Yammer, uh, an Israeli graphic artist, and he asked me, he said, hey, I like your work, and uh, if you ever need artwork done, you know, I'd be happy to help you out. And this is, I love getting letters like this, you know, it's, it's always great when talented people uh, want to help me, because my art sucks. <laughs> if anyone has played my old freeware games where I did the art, you can, you can tell my art, my art sucks. Uh, and so EJ, I saw his work, and he did that, um, if you look at the Wajidai site, you'll see that promotional picture for Shiva. Uh, and it's beautiful, that rabbi stone looking over the, uh, the, the New York skyline like that. And he um, came, on board, uh, came on board the Blackwell train when uh, another artist who was originally going to do these uh, close-up pictures here. Uh, Matt Gardner, who I talked about earlier, was going to sketch them, and this other artist was going to color them. He w turned out to be too busy, so he, he bailed, and I sent a letter to EJ. I said, hey, c could you do this? You know, could you help us out? And he said, sure. So I sent him Matt's sketch, and you know, within two days, he had this done. And it's, it's beautiful. I mean, look at this. This is just amazing. And um, this picture itself, uh, I, I really wanted to... You know, I don't really mention it. I hope you get it because I kind of hammer this home a lot. Is that you know, uh, Rosa earlier poured the ashes um, off of Brooklyn Bridge, and here's a picture of her and her aunt on Brooklyn Bridge. That's like the only connection she has with her aunt is the bridge. So they return to the bridge many times. That's sort of a reoccurring thing, the Brooklyn Bridge, because that's the only memory, uh, only thing Rosa has of her aunt. So I, ho I hope you got that. I hope you got that. I hope it wasn't too subtle or too obvious for that matter. But anyway, uh, E.L. Yammer, uh, Israeli graphic artist, awesome guy, amazing work. He single-handedly saved the project. He just did so many little things. He did the graphic inter interface. Um, he did all the inventory items. He did the map screen. He he did he did so much, so many so many little details that he just that no one else had time to do. And it, he just did such amazing stuff. So thank you, Mr. EJ. Uh, you did an awesome awesome job.